President Biden's laid out his plans to reform the U.S. Supreme Court, calling for 18-year term limits, an enforceable code of ethics, and an end to presidential immunity. Biden's plan comes a month after the Supreme Court granted former President Donald Trump broad immunity from prosecution for crimes committed in office. Biden stopped short of calling for expanding the court. He outlined his plan Monday at the OBG Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, where he commemorated the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. I'm calling for a constitutional amendment called No One Is Above the Law Amendment. It holds. I mean this sincerely. It holds there's no immunity for crimes former president committed while in office. I share our founders' belief the president must answer to the law. The president is accountable in the exercise of the great power of the presidency. We're a nation of laws, not kings and dictators. The second thing I'm asking for, we've had term, lim term limits for presidents in the United States for nearly 75 years after the Truman administration. And I believe we should have term limits for Supreme Court justices in the United States as well. Third, I'm calling for a binding code of conduct for the Supreme Court. That was President Biden speaking Monday. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson responded by accusing Biden of attempting to radically overhaul the Supreme Court. The House Speaker said the proposals will be dead on arrival in the House. We're joined right now in Washington, D.C., by Jennifer Ahern, senior counsel in the Brennan Center's Judiciary Program. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Jennifer. Why don't you start out by assessing uh, President Biden's proposals that he made yesterday in Texas as he celebrated the um, Civil Rights Act, and also how much chance they have of getting passed, now that we hear what the House Speaker has to say? Good morning, Amy. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's great to join you. We, I would say, this is a pretty big deal for those of us who care about the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, President Biden, I think, is somebody who uh, sees himself as an institutionalist and uh, a champion of the importance of the rule of law and the role of the Supreme Court in upholding the rule of law. And so if he believes that these kinds of changes are necessary, um, I think the public already believes this. Um, and so that that he has come along and is lending his voice to, to this call is, I think, critically important for this moving forward. Um, I, I, you know, understand Speaker Johnson's view, and I, I understand that this, that means this is perhaps a longer term uh, project that we are engaged in. And I think uh, politically, we have a ways to go before the views of the people and the, the common sense reforms of these kinds can actually uh, make their way through the Washington process. But I think uh, this is a really important moment in that long process. And um, we're just really grateful that the president has uh, chosen this as one of the things to speak out on in his last 100 days in office. Uh, but, uh, Jennifer, uh, the, the commission that President Biden established on Supreme Court reform submitted its report in late 2021. Uh, that's almost uh, three years ago. Uh, why did you think it took him so long to actually pursue some uh, recommendations? Well, I mean, actually, right, he, he specifically asked the commission not to give him recommendations. So it really didn't uh, give him even that list, which I think really goes to show sort of how much movement there has been in his thinking on this in the last few years, right? That that he didn't even want to consider recommendations in, in those early years of, of his administration. And so I think that that is a sign of, of how far his thinking has come and how far, um, you know, more broadly, uh, the public's thinking has come on on this issue. And so I think that that really is why I think we are where we are today. And what about this proposed 18-year term limit? How would that affect the uh, court's stability and continuity if it were enacted? I think it would put the court on a more sustainable path in terms of how it relates to the public and to public support for and, and views of the court's legitimacy. Um, it's worth remembering that 
really the Supreme Court has nothing other than its legitimacy, right? There's no, um, it has no army, it has no power of the purse. You know, in our constitutional system, the court's legitimacy and the respect that that we as a country have for it is really all it has. And so um, something like term limits that would bring the court more in line in a very long-term sustainable kind of way with where the public is and where um, and, and with the issues of the day, I think are is really important to the court's overall legitimacy and, and putting it on that path. So, <clears throat> Jennifer, if you could more specifically address the points that Biden is making, what would an 18-year term look like? And if there was an 18-year term, who would be off the court right now? So the longest-serving members of the court at the moment are Justice Thomas, uh, Justice Roberts, and Justice Alito. Um, so you, depending on exactly how you implement uh, a reform like this, and there are lots of different ways to do it, you would probably see those folks rotating off um, first on on the list. Um, you know, I would also say in general, if you look at really big picture, what would this do? Uh, remember that the president obviously is the one who who nominates Supreme Court justices. And so you would see the whatever swings there are on the court uh, in terms of of partisan uh, who who appoint the partisan who appointed the justice, that would more closely track how presidential elections have gone over time. And that's really not what we see on the court right now. We see um, the appointees uh, from President Donald Trump having, you know, a huge, having appointed three uh, Supreme Court nominees, which is more than, you know, than any other president. So you see, you would see some of that smoothing out over time. Um, the New York Times also had a, a graphic this morning that showed that um, if term limits had been in effect in the past, we would see a 6-3 liberal majority at the moment, as opposed to the 6-3 conservative majority that we currently see. So um, that's sort of how you might want to think of it generally. And obviously, the specifics uh, depend a little bit on how you actually put this into place. Well, Jennifer Ahern, I want to thank you for being with us from the Brennan Center, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. In July, Democratic Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez filed articles of impeachment against justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito over alleged ethics violations. The news outlet ProPublica revealed Thomas failed to disclose millions of dollars of gifts from billionaires, in one case accepting luxury trips virtually every year, from right-wing megadonor Harlan Crow without disclosing them. The Supreme Court justices have since agreed to a co Code of conduct. On Thursday, Justice Elena Kagan became the first member of the Supreme Court to make a public statement in support of adding an enforcement mechanism to the new ethics code. Kagan spoke at an annual judicial conference held by the Ninth Circuit. I think that the thing that um, uh, that can be criticized is, you know, rules usually have enforcement mechanisms attached to them, and this one, this set of rules, does not. I think, you know, both in terms of enforcing the rules against people who have violated them, but also in protecting people who haven't violated them, I think a system like that would make sense. For more on this, we're joined by Andy Kroll, investigative reporter for ProPublica, part of the team who just won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service Journalism for its investigation into politically connected billionaires lavishing luxurious gifts on Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Um, also, the fact that they support organizations that have cases before the Supreme Court. Your response to President Biden and to Justice Kagan. I think the statement from President Biden, and especially the comments from Justice Kagan, show how much the conversation around Supreme Court reform has changed in just the last 12 to 18 months. I mean, thinking back to what Jennifer from the Brennan Center said just a moment ago. The difference between when the Presidential Commission did its work and put forward its not recommendations back in 2021 to where we stand today is pretty stark. The fact that President Biden is using the bully pulpit as a lame duck president to push for these reforms, to really drive this conversation, and then the fact that a sitting justice in Elena Kagan is saying, this new code of conduct, a code of conduct that was issued in response to ProPublica's reporting, 
is not enough, that it does not have enforcement, it does not have teeth in the way that the Code of Conduct for every other federal judge does, I think really shows how far this conversation has come in just a year. Obviously, it has a ways to go, given the politics of Congress right now and what we heard Speaker Johnson say. But we've never had this kind of conversation about Supreme Court reform in modern history. So that alone is a notable thing. It just shows the you know, impact, one, of investigative journalism, but also the impact of this decline in public trust for the U.S. Supreme Court. Andy Kroll is an investigative reporter with ProPublica.